Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Data Magnet and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again. And now, on to the story. Confrontational Conservation, written by Dathwin. That easily was the most bizarre visitor that I've ever seen. I've spent many years at this quiet conservatory. My primary purpose is to observe the wildlife. But my secondary purpose is to monitor other sentients that come to visit the lush jungle moon. Eons ago, my people ravaged our planet's natural resources and drove much of our wildlife to extinction. But as we began to journey amongst the stars, we found that Axanus, the larger of our two moons, was capable of harboring life. Thanks to a few selfless individuals who had hoarded preserved samples, DNA and observational data on our wildlife, we were able to recreate a portion of our original biosphere on Axanus. Since then, we have perfected our terraforming efforts, recreating all the conditions of our homeworld, even injecting millions of tons of molten iron into the core to increase the natural gravitational pull within a millionth of a percent of that of our homeworld all while pushing the moon further out to minimize the impact of the changes on the moon itself. We even reshaped the terrain to mimic that of the world before civilization. Now we have a perfect garden, wholly natural. It is common practice to visit for my people, to commune with the wildlife and environments of our ancestors. Though nothing of the original remains, this small haven is enough for us. It is sacred to our people, but our ancestors did not believe in something as petty as ownership. We only intervened to preserve the balance. Matter energy conversion beams precise enough to target specific molecules prevent contamination by bodily fluids, hair, skin, and waste. Anything taken into the sanctum is removed by the visitors or by our system. Visits must be scheduled, routes registered, and participants thoroughly vetted to prevent poaching or harm to the delicate balance of the garden world. The latest visitor, however, is quite strange. Most traverse the wilds with quiet or avoiding the wildlife. Many are researchers, xenobiologists, and the like. This man, Steve, was also a conservationist. Based on my research during the vetting process, its meaning is not unlike our usage of the term. However, I found it strange that he was away from his ecosystem. His vetting process, that was vexing as well. The humans were new to the Federation. So little prior to their acceptance was documented. The humans themselves had plenty of their own documentation that they merged with the galactic databases. But it wasn't as thorough as ours, and barely met the minimum requirements. Even by human standards, though, this man had a little in the way of records. Aside from his birth, the only files he had on record were medical in nature. Often grave, sometimes even life-threatening, and almost always caused by some form of wildlife. Based on that alone, I would have denied him entry, but the third entry, chronologically, changed my mind. I am nothing if not thorough, so even though I had made up my mind by the second of his medical records and persevered, I wanted my case for the denial to be beyond reproach. His petition had been handed to me by the office of our Ambassador General, after all. I would have read the whole thing either way, but the Ambassador General wouldn't accept a simple no. That third record changed my mind. Gunshot wound to the abdomen. I double-checked to make sure, and my suspicions were confirmed. He was injured with a projectile weapon. As I continued to peruse the records, searching for specific citations that I could use to the case of denial, a terse report written by local authorities is what actually changed my mind. 
While in the wilderness observing a herd of elephants, Mr. Irwin discovered a group of uh, likely poachers stalking the herd. He confronted them and insisted they leave. He was shot during the ensuing altercation. He was evacuated by helicopter to the trauma center in Gaborone. I was confused. If he was a legitimate conservationist, then why the dozens of injuries from wildlife? I was answered quickly. As I remotely observed Steve, he didn't seem all that odd at first, aside from his habit of speaking to the camera drone he brought with him as if he were addressing a friend or audience. Sensors indicated that he was not, in fact, broadcasting anything, and the drone recorded everything, even his boring hikes through the wilderness, when he made and broke camp everything. It was his first interaction with the local fauna, the Crooken, that would set the tone for his entire visit, that revealed why he had so many injuries. It also made me wonder what kind of monsters live on that man's homeworld. Crookens are predatory creatures. They hunt by stalking their prey, by skulking from tree to tree. When the time is right, they drop down on their prey, latch on with their hind limbs, pin down their arms with their lower forelimbs, and strangle them with their upper forelimbs. One crooken, a juvenile male based on his downy fur, was stalking Steve through the trees as the human admired the many colorful flowers and fruits endemic to the tropical valley. Based on his behavior and a few of his comments, Steve knew about the crooken, even surreptitiously commanding his drone to glance up at the creature from time to time. Eventually, as he stood on his hands and knees next to a bush that can only be found in that particular valley, and spoke into the camera drone about it, the crooken dropped from the tree and latched onto the human, wrapping its short, strong arms around his neck. However, rather than panicking, as most do, Steve greeted it and continued to address the camera. He then sat back calmly in what I assume was a more comfortable position. Crikey! Steve exclaimed, accurately describing the texture of the fur, the behavior, the hunting methods, and other interesting tidbits of information about the crookens as it struggled in vain to close the human's windpipe. Other than a slight increase in the pitch of his voice, the human seemed largely unaffected by the crooken's attempt to kill him. He then began to do something that I had never in all of my life seen a sentient do. He began to pet it. Its arms, head, neck, and eventually its chin. Due to the curvature of their arms and claws, the chin is a hard-to-reach spot for them and you will often see crookens rubbing their chins on each other or on trees to scratch them. It's something that they thoroughly enjoy. This juvenile was no exception. As its grip around Steve's necks, torso, and arms began to slacken, Steve gently but firmly lifted the beast over his head, turned it around, and then lowered it into his lap. After a little fidgeting, he figured out the position in which the crooken mothers carry their young before they were strong enough to traverse the trees on their own, all while petting it and addressing it in soothing tones. Eventually, the crooken's instincts kicked in and latched onto him, nuzzling into the human's chest and cooing. All the while, Steve was listing off all of the most interesting features of the crooken, occasionally addressing the crooken itself. Finally, when he had given a rather thorough lecture on the crooken to his drone, he gently plied the creature off of him, placed it on the trunk of a nearby tree, fed it a small frog that he'd plucked from that tree's roots, a common treat given to the infantile crookens by their mothers while they were learning to eat solid food, and continued on his way. These bizarre interactions continued. Wild, dangerous beasts, the kind you'd give a white birth, would cuddle or lounge with him as he talked about them in calm, quiet tones at his drone. I quickly understood how he had acquired all of those injuries. This man had no fear, only love. It warmed both of my hearts to see this kind of conservationist, fearless in his love of nature, willing to risk life and them to interact with them, yet always managing to do so on their own terms. He spoke to them, 
not just with words, but with his body language, demeanor, and tone. They all instinctively came to understand that he was no threat, only a passive observer, maybe even a friend. What concerned me, though, was that in spite of his recklessness, he ramped up his two weeks of journey through over a thousand kilometers of wilderness with no injuries. And definitely not for lack of trying. Scatter claws slipped across his skin. Tolmo fangs squirted venom harmlessly across his forearm. Gamal constrictors hung from him like tightly wrapped shawls. Even the peerless Zorg beast, which would trample and gore anything that displayed even the slightest hint of fear or threat in their presence, grazed peacefully around him. They even allowed him to play with their young. Never in all of our history had anyone recorded an image of a sentient in the same frame as a living Zorg beast infant. And yet, there he was, carrying one at his shoulders as three more chased him around in play the adults grazing idly in a protective circle around them. I could hardly tell the difference between his laughter and their praise of joy. When he left the herd the following day, he managed to mimic the sign of respect juniors show their seniors by getting down on his knees and elbows with his hands tucked under his chest, while tapping his chin to the ground. The matriarch actually acknowledged the gesture, by lightly tapping the soil with one of her hooves, before the herd turned away and continued their migration. During the many boring stretches of Steve's visit, I researched him more, diving deeper into the human databases. I eventually stumbled across records of his ancestors in human entertainment media. He was named after a distant patrilinear ancestor, eight generations back, and came from a line of famed conservationists who sought to bring attention to the wonders of nature. As he left, we began the cleansing protocols, only to discover that aside from some hair, oils, and dead skin, he had left nothing behind, not even excrement or microbes. I revisited his list of equipment and found that he brought equipment specifically for that purpose. He carried all of his waste off the planet with him. He even sterilized his skin and internal organs beforehand, knowing that he would require rather extreme medical attention upon his return. While he was recovering, I received his request to visit Axenus again. This time, his route was through the remaining regions that he hadn't visited on his first journey. I approved it immediately, under the condition that he visit my conservatory first. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.